So in the beginning for us, um, Darren and Carl in particular, uh, worked on Blue Box, which was basically just a nice, pretty GUI that sat on top of FreeSwitch. Um, made configuring FreeSwitch a little less tedious uh, than the XML that FreeSwitch generally does. Uh, these were some of the goals uh, in the original Blue Box project. Uh, we kind of met some of them. It wasn't really API based, it was more t traditional LAMP stack where all the HTML and stuff was generated server side and then just displayed. Um, it didn't have real-time messaging. You couldn't really interact with FreeSwitch in real-time. There were efforts, but they were always broken, it seemed like. Um, and the whole, um, you know, being able to swap out your database underneath. I think they were using Doctrine, uh, if you're familiar with that. It just became a nightmare, performance-wise. Um, so it was all right. It was good for what it was, but it wasn't something that you would build a very large business on top of, necessarily. So the kazoo goals were very similar. Um, a few slightly tweaked, uh, redundant over the WAN. Um, we wanted an Erlang and JavaScript stack. Um, and instead of a traditional SQL database, uh, we wanted to embrace NoSQL. And we'll go over why when we get to Big Couch, because I know we get, we get that question a lot. Um, so you can see there was a lot of overlap. A lot of the lessons we learned doing Blue Box were applied to Kazoo, uh, so we weren't starting from zero. Uh, so that's kind of where we went. Um, as far as the timeline, Blue Box, uh, which was free PBX v3 uh, originally, uh, so that's where we kind of started to experiment with this. We had a couple customers early on that wanted to do uh, sort of the idea of what Kazoo is now. They wanted to do that using Blue Box. Um, this is also the client that wanted to rsync things around, which was awesome. Um, version one was called Whistle of what is now Kazoo. Uh, we released that, I think, in the spring of 2011. Um, and so that was the core of interacting with FreeSwitch, distributing uh, messages across the messaging bus, having multiple applications that could potentially respond to a given request. Uh, sort of that core infrastructure uh, was put into place here. Because um, one of the knocks on Blue Box was we didn't have those APIs, right? People didn't like the UI, but they didn't have APIs that they could call to get, just get the data and build their own UI. So with Whistle, we went to the other extreme. We said, we're not going to give you any sort of UI. Here's some curl commands, and here's all the things you can do. Uh, you know, build your own UI, and people were like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, okay, you have users, what does that mean? Um, so they didn't really, we didn't do a good job of communicating what was actually possible. So then with Kazoo V1, we hired a designer, uh, we started to think about the user experience more, uh, the initial UI was developed, um, and it became a much more usable platform from day one. You didn't have to know curl. You didn't have to know, uh, you know how to build your own UI. Uh, Kazoo V2 was the big feature push. This is where nobody wanted to use us because we couldn't tick off the 50 features that a broad software meta switch had, uh, even though they only used three or four of them. Uh, you know, they just wanted all the check boxes. So it was a big push to get all those checkboxes checked um, so that people would actually think that this was a usable platform. Um, and now with Kazoo V3, um, the focus is on polish and maturity and making this a project uh, you know, that is commercial grade uh, for whatever that means. Um, basically just giving it a more professional presentation rather than the traditional open source project presentation. Um, all right. So this is a pretty graph that Carl created. Uh, you can see that even our engineers have gotten a little better at designing things. Um, and this kind of shows a high level view of what Kazoo looks like, um, with that center square being Kazoo, and all of the things you can connect to it being on the left and on the right. If this is your kazoo cluster as a whole, each of these verticals would be 
a particular uh, slice of your cluster, perhaps a geographic location, perhaps a class of customer, however you and your business want to chunk it up. But the idea being that every single one of those components, the SVC, media servers, applications, and database, can be replicated and cloned as many times as you need per cluster. And then you can have as many of these clusters as you want, creating the mega cluster, I guess. I don't know, it's always hard to find the right words. Um, but the idea being is that you can shard your cluster um, to provide better geographic redundancy, to provide different classes of service, but all the same core. Um, so for instance, you could have you know, one of those slivers have really you know, cut rate carriers where the voice quality is so-so uh, most of the time. But you sell that at a hugely discounted rate. Um, and then you might have another where you have very high value customers, where you have very good carriers. Um, and then maybe another where you have you know, all your VPN tunnels and things like that. But that's the idea. They all operate sort of in their own little sliver with only the database bridging the gaps uh, between the, the various clusters. And then this side on the right with the carriers and the providers, different services, that's really where we see you know, companies like what you all do, differentiating yourself. All right, so an individual slice of the cluster, what might that look like? Um, so up at the top, you'll have your web browser. Uh, you'll have an API program maybe that you guys run. Um, and then your phone. Uh, so th that's how the user will come and interact with the system most often. Um, so we provide the HTTP server uh, that powers the REST APIs, powers the UI, things like that. Um, and then you have your devices connecting to at the SBC, which then relays things to the media server, which asks eCall Manager what to do, and then eCall Manager puts out a request onto the messaging bus saying, who can handle this particular query? Um, so then in here in the application layer, this is where all the different apps, so they're kind of built like microservices where they do one thing. Um, and you can replicate how many instances of that particular application there are. Um, and then your back-end support services, this will be things like billing through Braintree, which is what we currently use, but you could attach other billing trees, uh, billing engines. Um, different carriers provide API access for purchasing numbers, adding E911, CNAM, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you would have you know, one or more database nodes per, per uh, shard. All right. And if we look a little deeper, um, you can see some of the various applications. Yeah. So that's kind of just a big high level overview of how all the different services, um, you know, how the messages might flow from the user to into the system. All right, RabbitMQ. The glue that binds. So representing where rabbit lives is a little tricky because it kind of lives everywhere. Um, in truth, the arrows connecting applications in the SBC uh, should not intersect the media servers, but it's kind of hard to represent a curve around it. Um, the media servers do not talk to rabbit right now. FreeSwitch does not talk to rabbit directly. Uh, everything goes through eCall Manager. Um, but Camellio does talk directly through Rabbit to Kazoo. Uh, and then obviously the Kazoo applications themselves communicate to each other via Rabbit. 